All right, let's take a look here at managed Kubernetes providers. And so these could be something like a cloud service provider or a cloud platform that abstracts away the effort of setting up, maintaining, like such as updating and patching a cluster, and they can easily uh, perform auto scaling as well. So, um, I mean, that's gonna vary the auto scaling part, but um, you know, mostly this is how people are setting up their Kubernetes. They're gonna be using a managed provider, very common to use a public cloud, um, but we'll talk about the ones that I know about. I'm sure there's ones outside of this, but these are probably the most uh, popular ones, especially if you are used to using CSPs. So the first is Google Kubernetes Engine, GKE. And in my experience, this was the easiest to use with the richest amount of features built into the UI, right? So when I wanted to set up an ingress controller, uh, and we did this in the course or, or, or set up a service that goes ingress, it was so easy to do. Um, and uh, it just had a really great experience out of all the, the big CSPs. Um, next, I would probably put uh, Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service. Um, it does have a very difficult uh, uh, UI. So um, AWS is like, you know, sometimes you'll be setting something up and it'll be like, you need this thing. And so you have to go to this other place and create it first and then go back. And so there is a bit of uh, running around However, they do have a, um, a CLI uh, called um, EKS uh, CTL, I believe, and it really does make it a lot easier. So, uh, you know, it's not really recommended to use the UI. And a lot of people doing Kubernetes, you get used to using CLIs because of kubectl. But the real reason I think that Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service, I put it second, is just because it's worth it for the integrations with other AWS services because... Uh, you know, maybe uh, EKS is a bit clunky, but all the stuff around AWS, and that's what you want to be integrating with, like your uh, managed database and, and your persistent storage and things like that. It's just such a great ecosystem that that's why I put it second. But Google's really, really good uh, for uh, cloud native. You have Azure Kubernetes Service. This was fairly easy to use. Um, you know, it, like its interface wasn't as good as GKE, but you could uh, basically accomplish things. It has some unique offerings. Like I've seen like debugging live containers, which is really cool. Um, and they have good tutorials. So like the thing is, is that, you know, even though they're clunky, um, their instructions are uh, a lot better than AWS's. And so, um, you know, it works a little bit better, but this is like, if you are bought into that Microsoft ecosystem. So, you know, all three are, are pretty decent. And I put these at the top three. Next is IBM. Uh, cloud Kubernetes service, also known as IKS. It's easy to use, um, beautiful, beautiful UI out of all the UIs that I saw. Um, it wasn't as feature rich as I was expecting to be, and it was very, very expensive. Um, and so like IBM likes to say it is cost effective because they actually do allow you to spin up a free Kubernetes tier. So technically, um, you know, for 30 days or, or what have you, you can actually have uh, a free cluster. And this is actually a great way to test out a managed service. But the only problem is that the nodes are so darn expensive. And so you don't play for the control plane on uh, IKS or IBM, uh, uh, IBM Cloud Kubernetes Service, but the cost gets so expensive so fast. It's like using Heroku where it's like, it's free entry. Uh, the small SAP is, um, uh, you know, like very inexpensive, but then it gets super expensive super fast. So uh, I generally probably wouldn't recommend unless you are already using IBM and you like using bare metal and you're used to paying those kind of costs, okay? You have Oracle Container Engine for Kubernetes. Um, Oracle's known for being highly cost-effective out of all these other providers. Um, I don't think they charge you for the control plane, but honestly, their UI is really, really bad and they even default it to bare metal when you start to spin it up. And if you do that, it'll cost you like thousands of dollars. So it's easy to make a mistake when setting it up and costing a lot of money. And, um, you know, support on Oracle is not very good. So if you do have a problem and there's a high chance you will, you know, just being cost effective is not going to help you. One thing I'll, I remember about IBM Cloud was that when I set it up, it was really good at estimating the cost and making it very clear what things cost. So kudos to IBM for that, but even still, like it's still really expensive. You have DigitalOcean Kubernetes, so D-O-K-S. Very easy to use, predictable spend, um, beautiful UI. Um, and I mean, the only thing was that it was a bit like everything was beautiful, but it was a bit clunky to use where I was like, 
like you know when the experience is like the ui is so good but then like the technology kind of fails to deliver the same kind of reliability and so it kind of feels like there's this beautiful ui and then things are a bit clunky behind the scenes that's how DigitalOcean felt to me but it, but it was very simple to use you're not going to get that whole ecosystem that a cloud service provider is going to provide you but it is very simple and easy to manage if you're a startup this is a very safe bet for you to do is use digital ocean kubernetes so it's not terrible but um uh, DigitalOcean is very, 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 very good with uh, tutorials. Um, and they had some stuff there, but for D Kubernetes, I'd say it's probably the weakest I've ever seen them for instructional content. They even had a dead link that I had to point out and be like, hey, this goes nowhere. So I think it's more of a newer service for them. And uh, you know, as they continue to build out the resources around it, it'll be good. Then you have Sivo. Uh, it's the most cost effective. They don't charge for the control plane. Um, I wouldn't say the UI is beautiful, but it's extremely simple. So if you don't know what you're doing when you enter there, you might be a little bit frustrated at the start. Um, but uh, like if you use DigitalOcean, then you'll know how to use Sivos. Um, and they do have a nice like labs, like instructional content within Sivo. Um, but it really is just a cloud platform, but different from DigitalOcean, it is specialized just for Kubernetes, right? So they technically do have VMs and other stuff on there, but it's just, it, it's more focused on Kubernetes than any other cloud platform. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs there. You just got to decide what you'd want to use. For me, I'd be going with uh, EKS just because my primary workloads are already there, but I really did enjoy uh, Google Kubernetes Engine for sure. But there you go.